Thank you again, everybody. Thank you for joining this virtual event uh, organized together by DataArt and Upsolver. Very quick introduction. So DataArt is a global software engineering and uh, technology solution consultancy. Uh, we're helping customers across different verticals and around the world uh, accomplish digital transformation and data transformation, cloud transformation. And so in this journey, as companies are trying to monetize and operationalize their data and generate insights to drive better di business decision-making and streamline their businesses end to end, and in, in some uh, situations, even reinvent their business models. The plumbing, so to speak, the foundational piece, making the data available uh, and operationalized, putting the data pipelines into place, uh, taking care of you know, streamlined data preparation processes, this can be a quite, uh, quite a challenging uh, body of work. Uh, it's quite labor intensive, resource intensive, and expertise intensive. And so uh, from that perspective, looking at how to accelerate and streamline that foundational piece uh, is, is super valuable to our customers. So that's why we're very excited about our partnership with Opsolver and about this event. Well, we're gonna tell you, uh, not very detailed level, but at least on the high level, what can be done for your data lake and, and data transformation projects to accelerate and, and streamline that uh, data preparation process. Uh, a quick uh, point of process, towards the bottom of your screen, you should see the uh, question and answer button. At any time during the presentation, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in. Our speakers will try to address them as we go along, but if, if they can't, then towards the end of the session, we're budgeting some time for a discussion and a, a questions and answers session. Uh, our speakers, Alexa and Todd, I will uh, ask them to please introduce themselves um, when their time comes. Um, with that, without further ado, I, I think I want to take I give it over to Alexei. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Alexey Gorbunov. I am a solution architect at Data Art, uh, and specializing in big data and uh, analytics. Mm. In this session, uh, we want to focus on a few lessons learned in the process of helping our customers implement efficient data lake and lake house solutions. Um, <clears throat> two important facts I would like to start with are the number of data-driven uh, and analytic projects has increased dramatically in the past year or two. And technologies themselves uh, are evolving very rapidly. Data lake and lake house projects can be quite complex and quite intensive and require deep specialized expertise and knowledge. At the same time, uh, for many uh, enterprise IT professionals, it's a challenge to keep up uh, with the changes in technologies. Most importantly, practical experience is not something what can be accumulated quickly. As Angie Jesse says famously, there is no compression algorithm for experience. Uh, in practice, this leads to longer time to market for most new data platform projects, increasing migration costs and project risks. So for us at DataArt, one of the benefits uh, of being a consulting firm is what we have many opportunities to apply our knowledge across multiple projects and initiatives of, for our customers. The learning knowledge and expert, uh, expertise gained through planning and ex executing multiple cloud data migrations allows us to help accelerate and de-risk similar projects. On high level, for any data initiative, IT leaders are always concerned with time to market, cost efficiency, and ability to meet critical requirements such as operational efficiency, resilience, and compliance. On a more detailed level, whenever we are beginning to discuss a new data project with customer, the most common questions always are, how quick can you build the data lake? How easy it will be to implement ingestion for a new data source? How much support and maintenance will data lake require? What are the overall implementation costs? These transformations always start with data migration and data platform built out. And again, 
these steps can be quite difficult. What's why we are really excited to partner with AppSolver, who has developed an offering that addresses some of the most common data migration and pre data preparation challenges. Uh, we see many benefits of using AppSolver, including simple and efficient data ingestion into a data lake, easy to use ETL tool, efficient data tool, uh, data load in the most, pop pop most popular targets, such as Redshift and Snowflake, comprehensive monitoring and alerting functionality, and many other features. With that, I would like to turn it over to Todd, who will share it in more detail how you can accelerate your cloud data transformation by leveraging AppSolver. Thank you. Thanks, Lexi. Hey. Thank you, Alexei. Um, so as he mentioned, and it's Todd Odess, I lead all of our partnerships here at uh, Upsolver. And as the uh, alliances lead, uh, I work on a regular basis with Alexei and teams like DataArt um, to provide and, pro and provide our services to you as end customers. So um, with this and the questions that Alexei was asking, I actually want to start out by asking questions. And um, there are three that we're gonna ask up front to see what we can do. And at this point, I'm, we're gonna launch a poll. And so if you could take uh, and, and answer uh, the questions here, just so we can understand. The question is increasing amounts of data is creating more problems than solutions. The next question and the next poll that we'll look at um, is, Finding and retaining unicorn talent, and we like to call them unicorn talent because uh, they're going to have to know Spark, Scala, DevOps, Airflow, Python, you name it. They're easy to find and cost effective. Is this true or false? And the last question that we're going to ask is how many different programs or languages would you use to build a real-time machine learning pipeline? I know many of you on the call may not be machine learning pipeline or data, uh, data pipeline engineers, uh, but if you had a guess, how many do you think it would take to build this? And actually there's, there's not a right answer, um, but if we can put up the poll real quick. So why we're asking this question is because a lot of times you'll notice on the question beforehand and the question before that, the more data that's happening, the more problems you're having. And the idea behind that is the fact that it's not just the fact that you have more data, it's the fact that how do you capture that data? How do you actually organize it? How do you do all of the various things to make your data useful? And up until this point, before Upsolver, um, and I believe Upsolver has, has been able to solve these problems for it, but up until this point, a lot of times, the question around that, you needed to know many, many different products to be able to um, understand what your data is and put it in the right format, optimize it, move it to, into the right space. Each time it made it very difficult. But what Upsolver is bringing to the table is the belief of the fact that you're able to simplify the data engineering requirements to establish and create your data lake. You're able to speed up the process and deliver the value that you need to you, to your customers, for us, and all around the table. If you're able to automate all that, you reduce the friction that's required to create that data lake. You also reduce the cost and the cost overruns, or you're able to efficiently use the tools that you have at your um, disposal. And really how Upsolver does this is the fact that Upsolver is a tool, that's a pl automation platform that sits on top of your data lake within your VPC or your virtual machine, depending if you're on AWS or Azure. We sit within that system and we actually automate the data engineering requirements to do things like ingestion. Everything from streams to large data to small data to any type of data in, uh, ingestion that you're looking at. Most formats, most common formats that are in the market, we're able to automatically identify and read. Now add the fact that we're also um, optimizing the data. So no longer are we just putting the data into a format that's being able to be read or viewed or understood. We're optimizing it, which means that we're taking small data files and compacting them, making them larger files so that tools like Athena are more efficient on it. 
We're doing all sorts of things underneath and then also building out your metadata stores and identifying that allows you to connect to all the various other tools that are out there. So when they're going in and querying data sets, you're able to identify what data you wanna be looking at, how, what timeline do you wanna look at, whether it's raw, historical, live, streaming, it doesn't matter. All of this optimization, all of the different aspects that are happening, including schema on read, are allowing these tools to be much more efficient at what they're doing and deliver much quicker. And so you'll see over the time as we have this conversation today, I'm gonna to talk about a lot of our customers that have been showing that this is not just me telling you and me sitting on the other side of the screen saying, we can make it faster for you if you use UpSolver. We actually have proof and this has been done. Even AWS, our largest partner that we work with on a regular basis um, has been speaking about UpSolver's capabilities at their own internal meetings and with their customers and, and talking to, have, uh, to replace or to augment a lot of the services that they have. <clears throat> Excuse me, same thing on the Azure side. <clears throat> So what we're looking at here with AWS and the fact that they're talking about their big data best practices, what this means is tools like AWS Athena has 14 protocols in which you need to put and use with your data in order for Athena to effectively and efficiently use it. There's an idea behind the fact that one kilobyte of data that's being queried by Athena um, is basically the same amount of cost and compute that you're gonna have if you were to look at a gigabyte of data with Athena. And that's because the tool is not made for small data. It's made for large data sets, for big data, for to look at those tools. And what UpSolver has done is we've taken those 14 steps and kind of a tongue in cheek joke that we have here is that that's 10,000 lines of code within UpSolver. Now imagine having a, um, a data engineer spending the amount of time to put together 10,000 lines of code within your platform and then he leaves or that person is there and they modify it just a little bit and it's broken. How are you gonna be replacing it? How are you maintaining that? And so what UpSolver does is within our platform, maintaining best practices and maintaining best languages as you go forward. All of this is really delivered by the fact that with the platform itself, you no longer have to spend hour, uh, months building out data pipelines. With the, with the drop, with the click drop and um, visual U UI that we have, or using SQL, you're able to actually produce per, uh, code and produce data within hours, if not minutes, depending on what you're doing. So no longer are you waiting for your data engineering team to be able to build the pipelines for you. In fact, we empower a lot of the business users for self-service and those self-service can actually go in and do a lot of complex things with your data. A lot of times you're talking about a data lake you're not thinking about the fact that you want to be able to update your data. You want to do complex joins where you're bringing multiple streams of data sets together. You normally aren't able to do that on a data lake. That's normally something that a data warehouse has, or it's something with a large compute behind it. But what we're able to do is the fact that with our code using SQL, you can perform your traditional data warehousing tasks over a data lake. Now that also allows for non-data engineers to actually do that work as well because of the click and the, the drop down lists and the and the visual ui that we have within our platform this all provides the most cost effective way and the most efficient way to use your data as well because you're optimizing it over the most commoditized technologies s3 and aws or azure data lake services over azure and then add in the fact that we're doing all of the compute on spot instances and these spot instances allow you to not have to run your full compute at full value the entire time you're working. And which actually is allowing us to provide, again, much more efficient and much more data-driven aspects of the data. Now, one thing that I do wanna note is that these numbers on here, a lot of these are coming from third parties and from our customers that we're working with. And one of the things that we've been seeing is that based on third-party data, and it's from a uh, that we're unable to provide the name to because it's from a trusted source that um, it, it has not published the report yet. But based on that third-party data, a data lake powered by UpSolver is 50 times more cost-effective than a cloud data warehouse looking at an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of the required combination of pricing and cluster size for an average workload. Now think about that. I know it was a lot compacted in that one sentence, but the idea behind this is that UpSolver, because we are a compute and a data engineering platform, 
it's not only the cost that's coming into it, but it's also the cluster size and it's also the amount of compute that you're using. So if you are able to use the most highly commoditized technologies, instead of paying uh, for extra percentage points on top that may be an extrapolated layer on there, you're actually able to take advantage of the cost benefit of using, say, EC2 instances, a spot EC2 instance in an S3 bucket instead of more complex cloud data warehouses that are out there. And um, all of this, the faster query times, the cheaper amount, the, the less expensive compute that we have and the ability for optimization is also leading to things like improved data freshness. Now, if you're doing machine learning or you're doing dashboards, you're not gonna wanna look at, if you need to make critical decisions that are based on the data that's coming in, you're not waiting on 24 hour old data to make those decisions. You wanna make those decisions on the most clear intent of whatever's happening. And you want that data to be as close to the time that you're at suggesting that. So if you're doing <clears throat> things like call centers or um, IOT or uh, services, ultimately, you're going to be looking at wanting your data as close to the time of that anomaly or that question as possible. And so one way that we look at this is, and one, uh, uh, one customer that we've been working with is Meta Networks. So Meta Networks is actually acquired and part of Proofpoint provides a network as a service. And what that means is that it's the security around to be able to connect on a regular, to ad hoc connect uh, customers to your network or third parties to your network. And, but you wanna be able to do it securely. So what we were able to do with Meta Networks was be able to provide the ability for them to analyze the inflow streams of data for those that are actually accessing your network and knowing whether they're a threat or there's an anomaly or something along those lines, but also for them to be able to know how their customers are interacting with their platform. And so with Upsolver, they were actually able to deliver value to themselves within three weeks. And those within those three weeks, they were able to actually know, you know what, we can actually turn those dashboards to our customers and allow them to have insights into this. And so using tools within Upsolver, like our lookup tables and Elasticsearch, we were actually able to do real-time dashboarding of their security point at their endpoint level using Upsolver to show whether or not there's an anomaly, that there's security risk or something along those lines. And with Upsolver, they were actually able to deliver six months earlier than they initially had planned. Now imagine being able to process terabytes of streaming data daily with a one second average of query response time on those data lakes and on those dashboards. That means that their data freshness is one second, which means that when they're looking at a dashboard and the customer's looking at it, they're able to identify the anomalies one second after they happen. That provides them with the innate ability to actually provide even more services and more security to their customers. And we're seeing this time and time again. As you can see on here, we've got many customers that are showing that it's not taking the months that they had planned to deliver something, it only takes weeks. Most of you, if not everybody on the call, has interacted with IronSource and Pier 39. You may not realize it, but a lot of times, most of the advertising data and ads that are placed in front of you, you can blame these guys. These guys are the ones that have the data behind the platforms that says whether or not you should place an advertisement in front of that person based on their actions that they're having. <clears throat> and we're gonna dig into a few of these use cases as we go along. But one of the things I wanted to highlight here is Asurian. So Asurian, as everybody uh, most likely knows, is the largest um, insurance company for cell phones. So if you break your phone, you need to replace it, you're most likely calling Asurian to get it replaced at whatever reduced value that you're, you're spending it. So what they were looking for was really the ability to provide next best action and next best, next best response time to their customers so that when someone called in, based on the data that's coming off of the cell phone, they already know what's happening. So what one of the issues that they were having up until this point was they were looking at how do we get the ability for them to have, say, real time uh, data freshness in 30 minutes. They wanted just to have just a 30 minute delay from when the data was coming off the cell phone to hit the customer uh, pro, uh, profile so that when a call center agent picked up, they were able to do it. Well, that 30, that 30, second, 30 minute data freshness was blown out of the water. They actually have one minute data freshness now. So based on how, when the data leaves the cell phone and enters into the customer profile, 
if it, they've called one minute later after the accident happened or incident happened, the call center agent already has that information in front of them. And instead of worrying about how long this project was going to take, initially it was going to take a, a year for them to deploy. It took them two weeks with one person. And that one person actually works two hours a day approximately over that 14 day time period to deliver this project. So at the end of the day, all of these projects that we're talking about and everything that's happening is being enabled by the ability within Upsolver to not have to code, to use best practices within the platform, but also the ability for all of the out of the box functionality that comes with Upsolver itself. Now, all of these things brought together is actually 95% less effort. And that what we mean by that is talking to our customers and talking to our partners, we actually are able to judge just how much less time and effort is needed on a project than a lot of the competition that's in the market. And one of those is Databricks that we work that we actually partner with and we work with on a regular basis. But times that Databricks is used as an ETL tool require things like Spark or any other the specialized languages that are out there. And at the end of the day, our tool is driven towards DBAs and database uh, administrators or data engineers or data employees that are working with the data on a regular basis. And so because of that, we actually use SQL as the language of development for us, which really opens up about 20 times more people have SQL skill set than they do any of the other languages. Now, this actually is a leading point to the next to the last question that I asked was how many how many code, how many languages does someone need to know to be able to build a real time data, uh, real time machine learning pipeline? Well, this isn't a this isn't the exact use case that we were talking about when it comes to that, but this is, gives you light because without Upsolver Peer 39, they would have had to look at their EMR cluster and manage it uh, how they needed to. And the cost on an EMR cluster is significant compared to an S3 bucket. <coughs> They'd have to use Hootie to manage those clusters for them. They would then have to hire someone at New Scala, and then it would take them six months to get them up to speed to be able to use the the platform that they have. But by using Upsolver, it took 70% less time and they didn't need to hire a single person and they didn't need to write a single line of code. So what was the use case that they were looking at? And this is that something that we're seeing on a regular basis is that they were actually looking at replicating the Natiza response time that they were getting on their platform, which was significantly fast. It was very fast response time on machine learning code and on uh, contextualization of the data. So enrichment of their data, they wanted to replicate that in the cloud, but to do that, they would have to spend a significant amount of money for them to be able to do that. And what we are actually able with Upsolver, it only took them four weeks to move from on-premise to Tiza to Upsolver on an AWS S3 bucket with a data lake without hiring a single person, as I mentioned, and were able to not spend the money that they needed. By using Upsolver versus Databricks, which was the comparison at the time that they were running a test between, they actually used one sixth of the AWS infrastructure that they needed on using Upsolver versus using uh, Databricks, which at a time they were doing 200,000 events per second to manage all of that. And what they were able to do is only use five nodes, save them hundreds of thousands of dollars within seconds of implementing and turning on the platform. And they were able to maintain their system. At the end of the day with Upsolver, they were actually able to save $2 million a year just by using Upsolver versus the other tools that are out there. And it only took them four weeks to deploy this project. Now let's look at a second project on here. Um, and this is the last use case that we'll talk about, but um, that I'll, I'll present here, but I've got a few more if anybody has any more questions or are kind of looking for other areas that they wanted to poke, but the meet group, many people on this call probably have used an app with the meet group. They're a, uh, they own eight different meet, meeting and dating applications um, on the, in the market. Their biggest issue was that they were looking at each individual profile on each individual app individually within their own data silos. Problem was they wanted to bring it all together to be able to talk to each one across different times, uh, across them individually and have a more complete customer 360 view of what they were looking for. So instead of developing and using the, uh, and, and coding out and building something in Spark, 
they chose to use Upsolver. And so within <clears throat> weeks, they were able to deliver a full customer 360 platform that brought together thousands of streams from all the various applications and the various tools that they had within the aspect to be able to have a singular view of their customers. All of this while not having to hire a, database, a, a data engineering team, while not having to hire anybody specific within the teams. And so we were able to deliver that more optimized online dating experience for the end customer by uh, enabling them through Upsolver. And at the end of the day, Upsolver delivers the most performant data lake with the least amount of effort and specialized skill set required. And with that, thank you for taking the time today and joining us. Um, the one thing that I would say at the end is for if you are looking and interested, Upsolver provides free trials and free licenses um, for you as a customer to log on and go to app.upsolver.com and sign up for both our community version or AWS or Azure versions of our platform. And with that, thank you for your time. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, that was fascinating. So th there were uh, a couple of very powerful customer examples there. Um, by the way, uh, dear audience, I, I think I begin to see some questions coming in. Yep. Uh, okay, um, let me read the question out live. Todd, I think you're the best person to try and answer that. Can you unpack a little bit of what Absolver is doing? What is Absolver doing to make the lake faster? If I may just uh, uh, let you onto that question, I was pretty much going to ask the same thing. So all those 50X or 95% less effort, those sound almost too good to be true. And yet I, I know, of course, you know, since you're sharing this data, it's uh, true data. I'm suspecting that there's some clever engineering going on behind the scenes to uh, decrease the exposure to, uh, let's say, as for instance, AWS infrastructure costs. So maybe you could shed some light on that. I know there's some information on your website, but if you could just uh, unpack that for our listeners. Yep. So when you, I'm going to share a few screens, uh, a few slides as I talk through this, but for the most part, what we're doing is there's three key areas that we focus on with our tool. The first one is the ingestion of data. Our ingestion of data is the fact that is the ability for you to build those pipelines with our user interface that is just a, a few clicks of a button. You're not looking at coding out platforms. You're not doing anything of that sort. On the right here is our actual a view of our platform. And on the left is a view of Spark Structured Screaming. And what you can see on here is that by using the user interface, you're actually able to switch between this, which is the SQL code, or to a drag and drop, which actually has a the flows that you're working through and a few different buttons that you can click. Um, <clears throat> what you're what we're doing on here is that but the ability to use the um, click and drop aspect of our user interface, you're able to actually not have to send, spend the time coding out. First thing is that that makes it quicker. Second of all, when Upsolver actually ingests the data into a platform, into your data lake, it sits in various aspects. The first one is that um, when it's ingested into it, we have a raw layer where your data is captured. Your data is immediately then transformed into optimized partitions within the data lake itself in which we uh, automate the um, we are automating the ability for um, that data to actually the partitions are being managed automatically by Opsolver. And once the partition is happening, we're actually optimizing the data. So it's things like compaction that are happening inside. We're also pre-identifying the data for you. We're organizing it in a way that we're creating what uh, key value stores so that when you're looking to query the data or you want to access the data using those key value stores and using the metadata that's there, while also with the optimized size and formatting of the data, we're actually grabbing that data and providing it to you much quicker in that way. I know this is not the most eloquent way. I'm gonna tell you that I'm not the most technical person in the world, um, but we're, we do it from there. And so Vivek, I'm gonna actually have to hold that answer, star schema question um, for, I will have to follow up with you uh, to uh, tell you exactly what that looks like. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. J just for the benefit of the rest of the listeners. So Vivek, uh, thank you for your first question. And it, it, there's a follow-up question to that, whether this is being put in the star schema. Um, 
Uh, I think Todd, you're taking the easy way out. I'm gonna take the easy <laughs> way out. Taking the question, taking the question offline. Yeah. Uh, but 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 no worries, Vivek. We'll, we'll absolutely reach out to you with a, a detailed answer to that one. Uh, there's another question from Jag. Um, if querying over Upsolver data lake is so fast, why would you go further and sync data to Snowflake from the data lake? Or you could substitute any other cloud data warehouse. You don't in have place to. Of Snowflake. Right. My response is you don't have to. Um, you that comes down to a choice of architecture and what the customers are looking for. One thing is Snowflake has benefits like data sharing, um, has other benefits. And actually, Alexei, I'll turn to you and and uh, if you wanted to add some light to this around why someone would choose Snowflake um, instead of querying directly from the data lake itself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in general, uh, generally speaking, uh, data warehouse is still could be useful. Uh, in case if you have a very intensive aggregation. Uh, in this case, uh, Redshift or Snowflake uh, will still, uh, still can benefit us uh, to access our data. This is a major, uh, major point. Okay. Um, um, Todd, I was going to ask a, a quick question as well. So if you can help us conceptualize the landscape with regards to, like, we, we've just touched on one aspect of a data warehouse functionality that, uh, for example, uh, Upsolver, it, it seems to me like Upsolver can be a good answer to some of the questions that are typically asked of a data warehouse, but not all of the questions. So there are some use cases, uh, uh, obviously, that data warehouse is the best fit for purpose tool to address. But can you help us position these things sort of relative to one another in the overall universe of data tools? Yeah, so from a, in the larger scheme of things, um, data lake, it, this comes down to the question of data lake versus data warehouse. A lot of the data warehouses have their own specialized skill set and specialized tools that they have within the platform um, that they provide. And so a data lake is, is a lot of times we're seeing our customers actually using data warehousing as their effective analytics store. And so they're able to, it's kind of that raw layer. If you want to use the bronze, silver, gold layer, if you will, um, of a data lake or of a data architecture, typically your raw layer is captured where all of your historical data is stored in a data lake. Your data warehouse is gonna be used more of your processed and organized data sets. If you're not creating data marks or creating something along those lines in which you're specializing for say, the different lines of business or different customers within it. And that's where a data warehouse would come into play versus the data, where, the data lake itself. A lot of customers that are looking for the fastest query time or the fastest response time are going to be querying the data itself over the data lake, either using Upsolver's lookup tables or using some of our other partners, which are Presto, the, the Presto organizations like, or Trino, if you will, um, like Starburst, uh, Ahana, or any of the other querying tools that are out there. And even Snowflake, we actually integrate directly with Snowflake's external tables as well if you wanted to use an external table query from Snowflake, if that's your analytics store. Hope that helps. Right. Uh, thanks, thanks, Doug. There's another follow-up from Jag. Can you talk a little bit about data catalog and governance in Upsolver? So we actually create, when we're do, creating the metadata, when data is being ingested into, into our platform, you actually can see it in here. On the left here, all of the data is then presented in a format where we are identifying the, all of the schema as it's being introduced into the platform so that we're creating metadata stores. And so using Glue Catalog, we create a metadata store and a Hive meta store, sorry, <coughs> which then is used as your interaction point with all the other tools. We don't have a direct data catalog within Upsolver. We would integrate tool with tools that are data catalogs, but we would be creating all of the schema or identifying all of the schema within the data itself to then position it and to transmit it to all the data catalog tools. Now, from a governance side of things within our platform, you actually are able to um, use single sign-on, you're able to uh, mass data, unmask data, you're able to uh, role-based interactions with the data as well. So based on the person's role within the organization, they are able to access what data, see what data, so call center agents. You're not going to show them all nine digits of social security number. You're only going to show the last four or whatever the identifying number is of that customer. I would also add uh, Absolver has uh, capability uh, for data lineage. Uh, 
which is uh, pretty interesting and important uh, for data governance as well. Yeah, so within this, the metadata that's created, the data lineage of where's the data coming from, where is it going, what transformations happen to it, all of that is captured within our platform and used within and, and managed so that if you have other tools, like monitoring tools, um, there are data monitoring tools like Datadog or Git or any of the other ones that are out there, we have direct integrations with those for you to be able to use those tools from a monitoring perspective, from a governance or from a, something along those lines. Uh, a quick question. Do you guys integrate with, with standard data lineage tools like Atlas or Calibra? Uh, with Calibra, I know, yes. With Atlas, if they're able to access a Hive Metastore uh, or Glue Catalog, yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question that may be potentially a stupid question, but um, I know that you shared in the conversation that part of the reason why you are able to be so cost effective is the extensive use that you make of in case of AWS as the underlying infrastructure, the extensive use of spot instances. Yeah. How does that work given your super fast response times? Because spot instances are by definition sort of ephemeral. So is there like a chain of spot instances constantly running and you're jumping um, for lack of a better phrase? Or so if, if, if that's not revealing any commercial secrets, of course. No, no, no. So we actually use um, our spot instances within the platform uh, to manage this. And you as a, uh, there is your manage, the person who manages the platform as they create the clusters or create the data lakes, you actually identify what clusters you want to use and how much horsepower you want to put behind this. So if latency is a key, key concern of yours, you can identify that you want to have more spot instances on call that are primed, if you will. Prime, right. Yeah, they're primed for you so that when you do have use of them, they're able to spool up and spool down as quickly as possible. There's other ways where we have customers that are more worried about cost association. And so within our platform, you can actually, there's three skill, three aspects that you can say. Um, you can set your cluster management to. The first cluster management you can have on it is that um, you're, you want latency over cost in which we will prioritize the use of compute to ensure the fastest turnaround time on of the data movement. But then there's the other aspect of it um, where the second choice is cost conscious, which, in which we the, the platform itself automatically maintains um, a certain cost level. So it won't spin up too high um, or overrun or keep a, keep a cluster running unnecessarily for as long as it's running you don't have to go in and say, turn on and off. It's based on the actual needs of the platform. And the last choice that you have is custom. You can go in and actually say, this pipeline gets eight core, this pipeline gets one core. You can actually identify that. And we have monitoring tools within our platform that tell you exactly which pipelines are eating up the most amount of compute that you have um, or costing the most money or are not costing you any money if you look at it that way. And so it allows for you to, to balance that. And Jag, the question around pricing that comes into play as well is that our pricing model is based on data volumes. And so our, we are based on how much data is coming in to the platform. We're not charging you for the compute um, <clears throat> like an EC2 instance because you're at, we're running within your VPC. So it, man, it runs and manages as if you are using an EC2 instance just as if you are. And as we mentioned, some, something to think about as well uh, for everybody on here is that from a POC perspective at OpSolver, there is, um, there, we're not charging you to run POCs or pilots or test this. We actually have a community edition as well for you. So if you want to go in and um, test the tool, use it, understand it, more power to you. Please log on and, and, and uh, sign up for it. Alexei and his team are here to also provide if you're looking at what's the architecture supposed to be? What is, what's the best form in which to use UpSolver? What are the use cases that would be best affected or how can we use most effectively UpSolver for them? Alexei's team is, uh, and Peter's team, that's what they're here for. And that's what they've been providing to the customers. That's well. right. That, I guess this is the time for a shameless plug of data. I'm so, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no worries. You're doing my job for me. Uh, but but yes, uh, uh, data and UpSolver obviously work together to address customer customer requirements and, and, and customer uh, transformation needs, right? So we're, we're addressing only one bit of a very complicated value chain. 
but it's a foundational bit and, and it's all important. So uh, like we said, data preparation is a major pain in any in, in every single data project that I have myself been a party to, data preparation is the most painful and prolonged part. So the ability to streamline that part uh, by using Absolver you know, or, you know, or, or other useful tools is obviously a great value to any organization. So we're uh, partnering on specific customer opportunities to to design and implement modern data infrastructures in the cloud for our customers in in you know, a variety of verticals. So if you if you're considering or are in the middle of or at an early stage of your data transformation journey, uh, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to sit down and and. Uh, try to understand what you're trying to accomplish to uh, help you craft or refine your data transformation strategy and select tools and specific steps that can accelerate that journey for you. All right, so uh, I don't see any other questions coming in through the Q&A window, so I'll ask my own. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, how a customer could uh, leverage Upsolver if they are in a hybrid uh, sort of infrastructure setup? where part of their estate lives on-prem and but there's also a cloud estate as well so can you speak a little bit to your experience there absolutely there's a few different ways upsolver has direct the ability to directly connect to on-premise platforms through jdbc um, connectors through apis or through any other or through many other connectors that we have um, if it is a, a legacy system that's closer to a mainframe as 400 or some things of that sort we have partnerships with other platforms like uh, Open Legacy and a few others that actually create APIs around those to allow for you to interact directly with that data and grab that data sets. Um, that gets into more complex deployments. Um, and so we are able to um, manage that for you, uh, to interact with them and to land the data into an S3 bucket or to ADLS, um, which will allow for Upsolver to sit on top and manage. That's another way of doing that is that, it, Upsolver doesn't need to be the tool that's ingesting the data directly to your data lake. You can also have other feeds that are feeding that data lake or have historical data that sits there. And once that's done, Upsolver is actually, when you instantiate Upsolver on the data lake, that optimizations that I was talking about, the partitioning, the, the data generation and the data identification is all happening automatically as well. Um, so you're allowed, so we're able to merge those multiple different data sets into your data lake to make it more uh, functional. For you hope that helps thank you uh there's a question from santosh uh can you speak to concurrency me personally no i i, will, I would have to uh bring in actually alexa do you know the answer to the concurrency question um let me uh if not santosh will we have to follow up yeah i, I believe this question should be addressed to AppSolver architects uh, mostly but uh, i my personal experience says uh, concurrency is not a problem with AppSolver. No, it's all well, that. No, that's encouraging. <laughs> it's very high level. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to answer the question improperly, so I will wait for us to get a uh, architect okay. on the phone to, to answer that question correctly. So my understanding is that you're primarily geared towards streaming use cases, right? So it would it be uncommon for you to deal with a combination of streaming and batch Absolutely. or are, are you not a good fit for for batch processing no we are so we look at batch as slow bat as slow streaming uh we're an always on platform so whether you're streaming data sets or you're standing data sets it really to us it's treated the exact same way uh so from a latency from a compute from all the uh, from small data big data it doesn't matter to us we look at data as data um and so batch processes we have some customers that actually turn off upsolver and using our cluster control are actually turning the clusters all off. There is one node that must stay on at all times because it's your listening node. Mm -hmm. um, but it's um, once that hits, your compute spools up, transforms the data, manages, ingests the data, manages it, places it into the data lake and the partitioning that I mentioned, and then shuts right back down. So it's up to you as a user to say whether or not how you want to use the data. For us, when you get to in the more advanced aspects of the data sets, we actually recommend that don't save all of your data for that one drop at a time. Obviously there are some operational reasons why you have batch processes versus uh, non and the latency would not fall on the data lake or the or upsolver. The latency would then sit on 
where the data is coming from, where the data is going when it comes to that batch process. But yes, once it's landed, that's as, as I mentioned, you can look at historical data sets where it actually already is in your data lake. You can, lo you can look at batch processing and you can merge that all with your streaming data sets as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, my next question would be uh, working across different industries, including regulated industries, like, like for example, financial services, uh, we are, of course, very aware that there are some stringent uh, data protection requirements around some use cases. So can you speak a little bit to how Absolver specifically meets those safety, security, and regulatory requirements from, from a security perspective? Absolutely. So if you notice, the vast majority of the use cases that I had shared today are within regulated industries. So Assuring is an insurance agency um, in the financial they're going to have social security numbers. They're going to have a lot of PII data and, and personally and personal data sets that are there. They're also going to have some customers that are sitting in California with CCPA requirements um, or Europe with GDPR requirements. We, because of the ability for you to control where the data is going, who's viewing what data, and also controlling where the data sits and what data lake, you're never having the issue of data leaving your cloud. So if your cloud is with GDPR compliant, or CCPA compliant or whatever, um, we fit within your deployment that you have from a security aspect. Data is never leaving that platform if you're not there. Now, if um, if you're looking at <coughs> if you're looking at um, from a GD, uh, other aspects, Peer Thirty Nine, their key to that was all of that PII data about your usage, which is your cell phone usage, your where are you located, geolocation, all this information. And they're in Israel and in Europe, they're gonna have strict requirements. They actually chose Upsolver because of the GDPR requirements of their ability to say which data house, which, uh, which data warehouse on the cloud it was sitting in. So if it's an AWS instance in the EU and the customers in the EU, that data is not allowed to leave the EU. But because of Upsolver's ability to manage where the data is going, who's seeing it, and the masking capabilities, that's the key to it. And so add in the ability for you to, from a security perspective, also never have the data leaving your instance maintains that. So when a lot of times people are asking us, why aren't you HIPAA certified or other things of that sort from a compliance perspective, it's because we're compliant. Right. And compliant to all, compatible, sorry, we're compatible with all of those because our security structure is yours. We're not enforcing any security on your... Right. So, so as, as long as I'm a customer that comes in and takes advantage, let's say, for example, on AWS of a HIPAA compliant setup yeah. or something else that's certified by a similar body, you're just coming in and inheriting all of that certification essentially because you're not changing anything in the security setup. Nope. Okay. Um, there's another question from Santosh there. Um, and again, we're going back to data lake versus data warehouse, uh, but there's also the lake house concept. And yep. uh, DataArt has actually done a webinar on, on that topic um, a few months back. So uh, uh, between Alexia and Todd, can you guys speak very briefly to um, the lake house concept versus pure play data lake and what's the value add or what the delta is there? Yeah, uh, the core component of lake house uh, concept is uh, data warehouse, uh, for which we uh, can use for heavy calculations and heavy aggregations. But in many cases, we do not need to uh, store and keep all our data in, uh, data, uh, in data warehouse because usually data warehouse is a pretty expensive component in our architecture, in our solution. And some data, for example, reference data, uh, we can still keep uh, in uh, data lake uh, on cheap uh, S3 uh, bucket uh, storage and users on demand using uh, different technologies. For example, in Redshift, we have a component which is called Redshift Spectrum, uh, which can access to data lake uh, data directly uh, from uh, Redshift and perform joins and uh, any other uh, calculations uh, directly on data uh, which we uh, held uh, in data lake um, in our Redshift, uh, I'm sorry, in, in our S3 buckets. Uh, this is a major uh, difference uh, of these two concepts. Uh, so I would say uh, the lake house concept is um, next step uh, in uh, data platforms 
which include data lake uh, uh, concept itself. And actually, funny enough, uh, Upsolver actually released a, a blog today uh, uh, or earlier this week, um, specifically answering this question. So I will also uh, add uh, Upsolver's uh, blog post that will echo what we just mm -hmm. talked about there. And, and, and Santos, I just shared a link to that particular uh, recording itself on uh, Data Arts YouTube channel. So um, yeah, you, you can, uh, that was a particular, uh, that particular webinar rather was a demo that we've built together with a team from AWS, demonstrate the, the benefits of a lake house concept in it uh, for a, a particular set of use cases. In that instance, it was from the insurance industry, but the principle is gonna be the same. Um, we're almost up on time. Um, Let's see. Uh, I, I think, it, unless you guys mind, I think we can safely wrap the session up. I do want to thank both of you for uh, both the presentation that you've uh, prepared and also the, the answers to the questions and the discussion. Um, like we said, uh, Absolver and Data Art are working very actively together on a number of customer opportunities and uh, trying to accelerate the data transformation journeys for customers in, in multiple industries. Um, it's onwards and upwards from here. Uh, the, the scope and volume of, and scale of data transformations is only going to continue to increase as organizations are waking up to the reality of what, what can be possible uh, once the, your data has been properly operationalized and then all of those downstream analytics and insight generation is enabled. So um, thanks everyone again. We will be following up with an email to everybody, everybody who signed up. Uh, we'll share, uh, ultimately, we'll share the recording of this session when that comes online. And uh, Todd, you promised Vivek that you would reach out to him and Santosh, respectively, with those uh, yes. questions that you took offline. So let's not forget to do that. With that, I want to thank everybody once again for joining us for this session. See you in the next event. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.